Let's, uh, let's pray together. In that day, the root of Jesse, who shall stand as a signal for the peoples, of him shall the nations inquire, and his resting place shall be glorious. God, the one on whom the Spirit rested is the one who gives all the nations rest. And I pray today, this morning, that you would help us to enter into that rest, Lord, through faith, that you would help us to, for a moment, put down our swords, lower our defenses, set aside our presuppositions, and just rest in you. Rest in the finished work of Jesus Christ. Help me to rest in that finished work as I preach your word. Help those who hear to rest in that finished work and receive the implanted word with faith, which is able to save their souls. Help those who don't believe to stop laboring in their own efforts and just rest in all that you are for us in the person of Jesus Christ. We spend so much time fighting and waging and warring with words on Facebook, with our families, around the dinner table, with our spouses. Let there be peace on earth. Let it begin in this place, for it was bought, blood bought, by the blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. And so I pray, God, that everything that comes forth today, everything that's come forth already, everything that will come forth, it will come from a place of rest, from a posture of rest, receiving the work that you've done for us, not trying to work to gain your approval, but knowing that because Christ did the finished work, we have your approval in Christ Jesus. I pray that you would help me as I preach your word to rest in you, to rest in your sufficiency, not to trust in my own wisdom or my own cleverness or a turn of a phrase or anything like that, but you would just help me to trust on the wisdom that is pure, that comes from above, that's given generously and liberally by you, the Father of lights, with whom there is no shadow of turning, from whom every good and perfect gift comes. So break unto us now the bread of life as we look at your word. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I was really excited about the special election um, this past week. Was anybody else excited about it? So Leah was happy. Um, I didn't say what I was excited about it or what part about it excited me. The reason I was excited was because it happened during Advent. Um, and that's just very rare that elections happen in the month of December. And so I thought this would be a perfect opportunity to address um, what happened when the voters went to the booth and um, elected somebody. And I told Beth what I was getting ready to do. And in classic, Beth, Beth is a defender of Christmas. So if it doesn't look like Christmas to her, she's going to just boom. And she just... What's it have to do with Christmas? And so I just kind of smiled and said, everything. <laughs> everything. Politics, elections, governments. It has everything to do with Christmas. Everything. And the reason is because when Jesus was born, a king was born. Jesus was a promised king to a nation of people. Um, and so when you go to the book of Luke, Luke chapter 1, what does politics have to do with Christmas? Listen to what Gabriel tells Mary, Luke chapter 1, verses 31 through 33. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and, we, and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. A throne, a reign, and a kingdom. This is no regular baby. He's a king. The government will be upon his shoulder. Christmas has everything to do with politics and the way men rule over other people. You see this also when you get to the end of Luke. Luke chapter 24, if you just want to turn there real quick. Um, the disciples on the road to Emmaus, they're walking, they're upset. Um, and Jesus overtakes them on the road. It says their eyes in verse 16 were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what is this conversation that you were holding with each other as you walk? 
and they stood still looking sad. Then one of them, named Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? And Jesus answered them, What things? And they said to him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. Look at verse 21. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. They're disappointed because their political connotations of what Jesus was going to do for them were not fulfilled. He was the supposedly the promised one, the, the son of David, the one who had David's throne. Look at Acts chapter 1 and verse 6. Before Jesus ascends, if you could ask Jesus anything before he came, went into heaven, what would it be? I like to play this game sometimes. Like if Jesus were here and he's about to ascend and I had a chance to ask him one thing, what would I ask him? Look what they ask him. It's really interesting. So when they come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? So this is what their focus is. This is a, he is a king. He will rule. He's from David's line. He's the promised king of David, whose kingdom will have no end. Politics, rule, government, they have everything to do with Christmas. And we were fortunate enough to have an election occur in December. When we celebrate Advent, the coming of a king, so we could be reminded how terribly flawed our political system is. And everybody's political system is in compared to this ruler. As a pastor, I'm very aware that there's a, there were a lot of emotions going on Tuesday night. Some people were jubilant. Some people were relieved. Other people were very hesitant. Some people were downtrodden. All right? There's, there's, and, and, and that describes everybody in this room. What I just said, everybody in this room felt that. And yet here we are as a body of Christ, united in Christ, in spite of our liberal views or our conservative views or our moderate views. And for all of our perceived differences that we have, politically speaking, we're really not that different at all. If you think about it, the, 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 the most right-wing conservative and most left-wing liberal are very similar to one another, not in that they hold the same ideologies, but philosophically, most of them hold different ideologies the exact same way. So we may think we're different because we go to a different place, but you can go to a different place the way that you are, and just because you've gone to a different place or a way of thinking doesn't mean you're at all different. I mean, that's why there's such thing as Pharisees and um, licentious people. It's very easy for a person that is licentious and proud to become religious. They just take that same thinking and they apply religion to it, and they just do the same thing they did with unrighteousness with righteousness. And they're no different. But there is inside of each and every one of us a desire for righteousness, for justice, for equality. We have this built in. We all have a God-given desire to be ruled the right way, in fairness, with equity. And the reason we get so excited or downcast when somebody that aligns or doesn't align with our views gets elected office is because we think that somehow, some way, since they're like us, they will fight for equity and justice and all of those different things. The sermon today is designed for us to see the glory and beauty of King Jesus. And in so doing, may God prevent us from hitching our wagons to a horse with no legs. Because that's what you do, ultimately, if you put all your hope in any candidate whatsoever. If you put your hope for righteousness and justice in a man, you're hitching your wagon to a horse with no legs. Because the one who brings about the peace for which we were made, the peace that we crave intuitively in our relationships for other people, the one who brings this kind of peace 
is not the person that won the election or lost it. <laughs> They're all from the wrong genealogy for one reason. So, I want you to be hopeful. So if you're high, you're flying high because, you know, the Messiah was elected. I'm going to bring you down to earth a little bit, okay? Because that's where some of you are. But come back down, come back down. And some of you were just waiting for Jesus to come back, you know? You heard the results. You're like, thank God Jesus is coming back. I'm going to... I want him to come back too, but we should all want him to come back even though the person we didn't want to win got elected, right? So we're bringing you back. So we're going to get everybody to a level playing field so we're not tossed to and fro by the philosophies of this world. So we can, we can rejoice in this year no matter who sets in control, who the president is, it doesn't matter because we have a king. He came. He was God. He was born. He is God. He does reign. And we're going to see what makes him so different from the people that we elect. And that brings us to Isaiah 11. One of the reasons there's so many political connotations with the birth of Christ is because passages like Isaiah 11. The Jewish people were looking for a person that was like this, that had these, uh, these characteristics, these traits intuitively, that, that, that actually lived out the righteousness that God prescribed in his law. So there are a couple of things I want to look at in Isaiah chapter 11. Isaiah chapter 11 really functions as one unit. It's, it's, it's a literary masterpiece. It's got two poems. Those poems are, are it's, one of them is began with uh, the shoot from the stump of Jesse. Uh, the other one, it, it closes that with, in that day the root of Jesse, he shall send as a signal for the peoples, of him shall the nations inquire. And then it just further, it, it just, extrapolates what that means in verses um, 11 through 16, but we're just going to take verses 1 through 10 and look at this king and how he brings about an unexpected peace. So when you read chapter 11, verses 1 through 10, as John did, there are, I think, three things at least that stand out to me, um, and here they are. We're going to give them to you, and then you'll, you'll have the sermon to be done. Number one, Verses, chapter 11, verses 1 through 10, describe someone of unparalleled character. Unparalleled character. Look at what it says in verses 2 through 3. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon this person. This shoot from the stump of Jesse and a branch from his roots that's going to bear fruit. The Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. The Spirit of wisdom and understanding. In other words, he knows how to get to the heart of an issue and then he knows how to fix that issue in a judiciary setting, all right? So he's, it's, it's his wisdom in its purest sense. He, he listens and hears, and he can cut right through all the minutiae to the heart of the issue, and he can solve the problem. The spirit of counsel and might, this refers to his ability to plan for war and the power for carrying out that battle plan. So he is a a mastermind on the battlefield and of unparalleled power and might in executing the battle plan. And on top of that, he has a perfect idea of what's going on in the lives and in the hearts of the people whom he governs. He is a perfect king who delights in the spirit of the knowledge and the fear of the Lord, and his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. In other words, he's not motivated by the things that motivate us. Most of us, and to some degree, all of us to some degree, are motivated by the fear of man. So the things that we say, the things that we think, the way we respond to certain situations are often dictated by what that person is going to think about us. That's why we get in so much trouble for substituting doing the right thing for doing the thing that's expedient. We're trying to save our face. We don't want people to think badly of us. We want to be liked. We care what people think. It's not the way with this king. He's not driven by the fear of man. He doesn't have a bunch of uh, a constituency that he's trying to persuade or to keep happy. He is driven by the fear of the Lord. That's all that matters to him. Perfect wisdom, perfect might, perfect fear of the Lord, unlike any of Israel's kings. That's what Isaiah does here. He paints him in this light to show that no king is like this king. The king, like David, military might, prowess, the ability to plan a battle and to execute it, and yet he fails morally. 
Solomon has perfect peace, wisdom to decide disputes between the people. He fails morally. No, Israel has not experienced a king like this. There is no king like this. There is not one. We're too programmed to save our own necks to be like this. Unparalleled character. So much so, as it says in verse 5, righteousness shall be the belt of his waist and faithfulness the belt of his loins. In other words, the things that we've talked about are actually who he is. So it's one thing to seek justice and to love mercy and to walk humbly with God. It is an altogether different thing to be those things. We spend all of our time trying to do it, like seek justice, love mercy, love mercy, love mercy. And Jesus says, I am mercy. I am justice. I am truth. In his person, in his actions, in the way he decides, he is the embodiment. The word lived out of what God says we should be. None of us are like this. Even when we're at our best. Even when we are operating at 100%, we're not this way. He shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide disputes by what his ears hear, but with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. In other words, he doesn't use all of the popular catchphrase terms like diversity, equality, justice, the way that most politicians use these words. They use these words to appeal to a base to get their vote. They go to the they use words that bring in people from the fringes to vote for them, and then they get into office and they keep them on the fringes. That's not the way Jesus is. He doesn't just use catchphrases like equality and righteousness and truth and morality. He is those things. He's the embodiment of those things. There's so much a part of who he is that he judges with equity the poor. He gives his ear to people that can't give anybody on a different or in a different standing to give them their ear. We'll have your vote, but you go and have our ear. That's not the way Jesus is. He's a perfect king that does it all equally. And the catchphrases we throw around so flippantly to kind of show what side we're on, he is those things in his person. There's no one like this. There's no one like this. He's a man of unparalleled character, this future king. I'm going to end by asking who is he. I've already given it away. So much for the grand finale. Unparalleled peace. He's a man of unparalleled character, and he's a man that brings about unparalleled peace, which we get to the poetic um, section of verses 6 through 9. It's beautiful, isn't it? The wolf shall dwell with the lamb, the leopard shall lie down with the young goat, the calf and the lion and the fatted calf together, and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze, their young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the cobra, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the adder's den. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. It's unparalleled peace, and it's really broken up into like three main sections. So he brings about this unparalleled peace by his righteous character, and this is what you see change. This is why this king is unlike any other king. This is why I can stand up here and say, that nobody in the political office in the United States of America and our form of government will not produce this. No form of government will produce this. All of mankind throughout history has been searching for a way to produce this. 
So they go and live on communes. Or we start democracies. We, we are struggling with all of our might to put something in place where a rule looks like this, where the rule of man does this. And we've all failed. This is, <laughs> this is unparalleled peace because the foes of old, the arch nemesis are reconciled. Reconciliation of old foes like the wolf and the lamb. Does anybody have an idea what the greatest danger to sheep is while they're roaming? A wolf. But the wolf shall dwell with the lamb. What's Isaiah saying? This is a reconciliation of old foes to people groups diametrically opposed to one another are reconciled now. The leopard shall lie down with the young goat. This is the imagery that this, this, is, the, this is the reality, this poetic imagery just moving us towards. The calf and the lion and the fatted calf together. And this, this reconciliation is so complete that you could put a child on the throne of this reality and he could rule it. You don't need a savvy, wise person who's skilled in battle. Jake could rule this land. That's what he means when he says, and a little child shall lead them. This is a complete reconciliation that just blows the mind. And it's also a complete regeneration. The reason this reconciliation is complete is because the very nature of those who've been reconciled has been changed. So look at what it says next. The cow and the bear shall graze, and their young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. So when he says the lion shall eat straw, what's he trying to tell us? That the lion, on a fundamental way, has changed. He's no longer stalking prey. He's no longer a carnivore, lurking, stalking, waiting. He's an herbivore, grazing. The king of the jungle is eating donkey's food. It's a complete regeneration and a complete reconciliation because it is a complete reversal of the curse. So when you get down and it says, the nursing child shall play over the hole of the cobra and the weaned child shall put his hand in the adder, on the adder's den. That's an echo from Genesis 3.15. When mankind's arch nemesis was... The serpent. And there would come a seed from woman that would crush the serpent's head and the serpent's head would bruise his heel. The fact that a young child can go to the place where the serpent lives and is in no danger to be bitten by the serpent is Isaiah's way of saying, curse reversed. It's a new land. It's a new time. It's a new place. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain. For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters covered the sea. An unparalleled peace. The one on whom the Spirit of the Lord rests, verse 2 of chapter 11, and the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, is the one who who, who develops a resting place for the nation. In that day, the root of Jesse, who will stand as a signal for the peoples, of him shall the nations inquire, and his resting place shall be glorious. There's a little book in there, if you want to call it that. The Spirit of the Lord rests on this man, and this king gives rest to all the people. 
He does it by the Lord's Spirit. He's a man of unparalleled character. He's a man that brings about unparalleled peace. And he really is, lastly, an unparalleled person. And you know this, even if you don't have any Old New Testament knowledge, if you're just going to live in the Old Testament, you know there's no one like this man. By the way that Isaiah introduces him in the beginning and the way he ties it, a bow on it, at the very end. So look at what it says in verse 1 of Isaiah 11. That there shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots shall bear his fruit. It's a very poetic way of saying that there would come someone from Jesse's lineage, a king. Jesse's roots, from Jesse's roots, there will come this man who bring about everlasting peace. It's pretty cool. But it gets even cooler in verse 10. Jesus Christ is what? According to verse 1. The root of Jesse. I'm sorry. He is a shoot from the stump of Jesse. A branch that comes from his roots. All right? So in, verse, in chapter, one of, chapter 11, verse 1, Jesus is a shoot. Look at what he is in verse 10. In that day, the root of Jesse, who shall stand as a signal for the peoples, of him shall the nations inquire, and his resting place shall be glorious. Does anybody see why that is so fascinating? In verse 1, he comes from Jesse's root. Jesse upholds this long-awaited Messiah. But when you get to verse 10... The shoot is called by Isaiah the root. In other words, Jesus is both the shoot and the root. He upholds in a very, very interesting way Jesse's line from eternity past. He's the root of Jesse. He's the reason Jesse exists. And yet, at the same time, Jesse is the reason that Jesus exists in the body, with a, in human form. He's both the root and the shoot. Preeminent, yet personal. This is God. So, that you know that we're on the right track. Turn to Revelation 22. Who is this unparalleled person? I've already given it away. No grand finale anymore. Ruined it. Revelation 22, verse 16. Listen to the way Jesus speaks of himself. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you about these things for the churches. I am the root and the descendant, same as shoot, of David, the bright and morning star. So Jesus, at the very end of it all, says, I am that guy. I am the root of Jesse, and I'm the shoot of Jesse. That's me. I am the unparalleled person with unparalleled character that brings about unparalleled peace, and I did it in an unexpected way. This is why this sermon is entitled Unexpected Peace. This king does not bring about peace by defeating his enemies. Which is the way any kingdom would bring about peace if they're going to go to war. They can't do it through a treaty of some sort or through legislation or through talks. Jesus does not bring about peace by defeating his enemies. Jesus brings about peace by dying for his enemies. That's what's unexpected about this peace. That's what's unexpected about this king. And so we end with Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 through 22, and pray that God would show us just how great this peace is. All right, everybody, this is us, verses 11 through 12. Therefore remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh call the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands, remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope, and without God in the world. That's us. <clears throat> but now, in Christ Jesus, you 
who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he himself is our peace. So he's reconciling humanity to one another, Jews and Gentiles, who's made us both one, (coughs) excuse me, and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace. So what he does, he takes all these people that are different, Jews and Gentiles, liberals and conservatives, about as different, and he makes them one person by uniting them by faith in himself. He makes them Christ. That's what he does. He takes all these differences and he unites them to himself by faith. So as God looks at all these people that are different in so many sundry ways, he says, Christ, 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 they're in Christ. And he might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And look at the message that happens after this this occurs. After he reconciles us to God in himself. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So the one on whom the Spirit rests in Isaiah 11, who brings about ultimate rest for all the nations by his Spirit in Isaiah 11, who's called the root and the shoot of David, is in fact Jesus, the self-proclaimed root of David and shoot of David, who accomplishes all of this foretold peace by taking different groups of people, hostile with one another, hostile to God, reconciles them to himself through his cross, and then to God in one body, and therefore preaches, peace, 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 I died for you. And without this death, there is no peace. I don't think we understand how at war we are. If you take Ephesians 2 for what it means or what it says, here's the, here's the picture it portrays. Humans are at war with one another. Enemies with one another and enemies with the Almighty God. The only thing that unites us apart from Christ is our hostility towards God. Which means our greatest ally in our war against God is our most hated enemy. That's why there is no peace without Jesus Christ. Even our alliances are those of hate. No peace. But Christ dies and takes that hostility away. The hostility that we experience against, the hostility that we have against God. And then reconciliation happens. And regeneration happens. And the curse, the Genesis 3.15 curse, is removed. And Christians, even though we're different, united in Christ, we start living in step with who we are in Christ Jesus. And the more we live amongst one another, and the more we look at Christ, and the more He changes our lives from the inside out, the more of this new kingdom reality we experience with one another as we interact as a church family and as we interact with the rest of the world. Until Jesus comes back and fulfills all the peace promises that we read about in Isaiah chapter 11. A complete regeneration, a complete restoration, a complete removal of the curse, a complete peace that's accomplished not by war, but by his death. For a moment, at Golgotha, God surrendered in his war against humanity. But as always, he used what seemed to be Satan's victory to be his ultimate defeat. 
the very thing that we thought we could do to completely snuff out this God that we hate is the very thing that God used to bring us to himself. He surrendered. He surrendered. No one takes my life from me, says in the Gospel of John, but I lay it down of my own accord. This charge I have received from my Father. I have the power to lay it down and I have the power to take it up again. He surrendered. in our war against Him to purchase our peace with Him. Unexpected. No king, no earthly king can do this. Doesn't have the wisdom, doesn't have the power, doesn't have the means. But that's what our king did. He brought about peace, not by defeating His enemies, but by dying for them. And I submit this to you this morning as we close that you would surrender in allegiance to King Jesus. He is the king of peace. He can bring peace to every area of your life, every area of your life, every relationship, every crooked path, every valley, peace that passes understanding that will guard your heart and mind through Christ Jesus. And God purchased our peace through Christ when we were at our worst. When we were at our worst, you don't have to put on some kind of phony religious facade and be like, okay, I kind of got my life together. Will you accept me now? He died for us, for our peace with him while we were in shambles. That's the only way he'll receive you is you've come to him in shambles. Because that's what you are. Don't come to him with a religious mask. Got my life mostly together. You come in shambles with a broken heart and a contrite spirit these sacrifices the lord our god does not and will not despise and he'll receive you and he'll have you because jesus died for you that's why jesus dying for our peace releases us from this feeling that we got to be something or have something or do something to get on that right playing field for god to have us god has us because jesus did it all he paid it all he lived it all He bought our peace, free and clear. We had nothing to add to it. Just a broken life. A broken life is all we can give. And he'll put it together. And where there was war, he'll give peace. Where there was doubt, he'll give faith. Where there was gloom, he'll give joy. That's what he does. So if you're not a Christian, would you please obey the gospel Trust Jesus with your life. Trust Him to bring peace. And if you're up in arms about this election, it's okay. And if you think that we just elected the Messiah to the Senate, you're going to see that you haven't. You get, don't hit your wagon to a horse with no legs. Trust in Jesus. The king who came once and the king who will come again. And when he does, we'll understand what justice and mercy and equality and righteousness really mean and what they really do. Let's pray. Almighty God, we thank you that you sent your son into such a politically charged world. It's not much different today than it was then. So gracious, so kind, so merciful to people that didn't deserve it. Thank you for not crushing us in our rebellion, but thank you, but dying for us so that we might have peace with you. We pray for the regeneration and the restoration and the removal of the curse from every aspect of our life, from our marriages, from our relationship with our church family our co-workers, our children, our extended family, our friends. May you bring peace anywhere that needs to have peace, Lord. Heal us. Look down from heaven. Give your ear to our cry. And do exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ask or think. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.